you so much, uh, Quibus and Adrian and the entire Cape Town crew. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, and we're going to talk about Kubernetes. And hey, we're running a little short on time because computers, how, how do they even? Um, so uh, I will um, be happy to put some demos I was going to run online and we'll, we'll talk about that stuff later. Um, we got the, uh, you know, the wonderful intro and I will say that from the point of view of, you know, who are you and why are you here talking to us? I am Bridget. I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, we definitely run our DevOps days in our summertime because uh, July is the only month of the year that Minnesota has never logged snow. So it's, it's in the middle of the United States, um, directly below Canada. Please annex us, Canada. We're counting on you. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, and uh, I work at Microsoft. Um, you can tell by the sparkly shirt and the very on-brand hair. Um, and that's pretty much all we're going to say about Microsoft um, specifically in this talk, though uh, my colleagues are here running our table because we're sponsors and we'll be happy to talk to you there. Uh, I do podcast with Arrested DevOps, so if I don't look familiar, but I sound familiar, that's why. And um, I am, in fact, the chief cook and bottle washer for DevOps Days globally. And this is, I'm kind of an instigator. So um, I did say when I spoke at uh, ScaleConf in 2016, it would be so great if you ran a DevOps Days here. Hint, hint. And they ran with it. Um, I, I know that they pull this together with a small team. Um, I, ma I imagine that if you look at this and you think, Worrying about AV and coffee, that's for me. You should probably talk to these folks if you want to <laughs> join the committee and help. So anyway, let's, let's talk about uh, what we're going to talk about here. We're, we're going to focus on deving some ops because that's important. Um, we're also going to, you know, cooper some netties because you got to do that. And uh, I got to say, every time someone hands you a mic and like lets you talk in front of people, you should definitely prognosticate about the future. Wild predictions, possibly inaccurate. All right. And yes, uh, this talk does, in fact, come with spoilers. There's a spoiler alert because, you know, this way you can know, like, if you only care about one part or another, you can take a nap or tweet or whatever during the other parts. Okay. So... Let's start by a little bit of establishing. Um, this, by the way, is the 10th year of DevOps Days, which is kind of exciting. Uh, DevOps Days started in uh, Ghent. It started in you know, 2009 with uh, Andrew Clay Schaefer proposed an open space um, at an Agile, sorry, Agile 2008 conference. He proposed an open space about Agile system administration and then thought, oh, no one's going to go to that and didn't show up for his own open space. One person did show up and that was Patrick Dubois. And he was like, all right, where's that Andrew dude? He's not here for his own open space. And he went and found him at the evening event, I believe it was. And it turns out that that conversation of just those two people um, became this worldwide conference series. In 2019, there are 75 events worldwide. Um, so I say that because if you're thinking, I don't know about this open space thing, I feel stupid, what if I propose a topic and no one comes? What if I don't go to it myself and only one other person comes and then one of these fundamental movements comes out of that topic that I came up with? So it's totally fine if you submit, or if you um, put a topic in and only three people come to it, and those are the three people that you found your next startup with. Like, totally cool. It's just whatever it is you want to chat with people about, that's what you submit. And maybe there'll be a giant group of people and maybe there'll be a small group. But the most important thing is that the part of the conference where we're talking at you is fine, but the part of the conference where you're creating an experience by talking to each other is what you're going to take the most away from. Um, and it's definitely a good idea to, yes, you have a certain set of things that you expect here. Perhaps you think, I'm going to definitely learn things about Kubernetes. I do not know why that American lady is still talking about cats, but hey, cats are very important to DevOps, just so you know. But if you're thinking to yourself, like, I, this is not exactly what I expected, it, 
it probably means that you just want to be open to experiencing new things, which you will, you will get here. And I do think also that DevOps days having gone on for some time, um, there is a certain amount of tech cliches and people want to talk about containers and you're like, excellent, how many units of DevOps fit in that shipping container? And like, people talk about clouds, I work at a cloud, some of our esteemed organizers you know, work at clouds, and that doesn't mean, if you're thinking to yourself, well, I have a lot of vSphere and sadness, does that mean I'm not DevOps? It's like, it's fine, don't worry about it, because again, this is what you make of it. Um, I will say though that silos are for grain, and I took this picture in Minneapolis where I live, and um, silos are really dangerous, and not because they're a metaphor that's going to separate people in your organization. They're dangerous because the grain dust is highly combustible, and sometimes the silos just explode, and you're thinking, wait, that does sound like my organization. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, all right, so that's where we're at with that. Um, and then in terms of, all right, cool, computer stuff, because you just told us a bunch of social things, but I am here for the computrons. Okay, let's go back in time for a second. Uh, this is actually from Bletchley Park. Um, we had uh, code breakers and computer nerds saving the world, and you're thinking, oh, that was World War II, and that was a long time ago. And, huh, spoiler alert, guess what? Um, those of us who are actually on board with the technology that drives today's world, get to do it again, like, hmm. All right, we started in a place of computing that um, it was actually, it was really interesting. If you look at early computers and you think, how did they even work? And then you look at your current infrastructure and you're like, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, this stuff only sort of works and it only sort of works from the efforts that we're putting into it. Okay, so cloud, uh, really, do we need more than this? I mean, we could stop right here and just say this is the magical panacea that's going to fix absolutely everything. Except that's not true. None of those things are true. Um, and the reason it's not true is because it's all about the right abstractions for your organization. So if you're changing things in your organization and you need the right level of abstraction that will let you move at the speed that your business does, you know, demands, or that will let you stop worrying about the change control review board and the two week lead time for you to get a VM and come on, this is ridiculous, just take a credit card and go to one of our cloud providers of choice. Like, this is a pretty important trend in the space. Uh, it doesn't mean that your data center is, is over. I would say the days of your data center may be coming to a definite middle, and you probably want to look at uh, putting in the kinds of abstractions in your systems that will give you the flexibility to move to cloud where it makes sense, where it makes sense for your workloads. Okay, so that's kind of a set the stage. Um, let's talk about a bunch of these tools in this space. I do think that, and this, this is a quote from Babylon 5 that I think about a lot because honestly, it's very easy to stress out about our tools and it doesn't necessarily, we don't necessarily need to because there are so many choices. This is the, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation landscape, which doubtless you can find exactly what you need in there. Yeah, no, it's ridiculous. Like, it's huge. So you can take a look, go to their website, take a look, and land in a more perplexed than you started sort of place. Um, by the way, if I see people who are standing, and if you would like to sit, there are about six chairs within me, uh, or within a, you know, like, uh, first three rows will get wet at SeaWorld distance, which is not going to happen here, so you will be fine. Um, but, so the CNCF has this thing called the Cloud Native Trail Map, which basically takes that giant landscape map and distills it down to just a few things, a few concepts and a few things you might want to look at. I'm going to distill it down even more to just the first six items on that trail map because there's, there's 10 and it goes pretty far up the stack and that's, we're not going to talk about all those things. We will talk about containers. And if you're thinking, excellent containers, I've got that figured out, I've got that unlocked. So I, I am, you know, some percentage of the way to DevOps. Um, I will say that People get really hung up on containers, and I think the most important thing to remember about containers is that they are not real. 
as uh, Jess Fraz likes to put it, um, containers aren't real because a container is just C groups and namespaces. It's a collection of what a process can see and what it can do. And the reason I like to emphasize that is because people think containers will fix all of their problems and they super won't. I'm so sorry. If somebody told you containers will fix everything, they lied to you. Possibly they really want to hit their OKRs for the quarter and that's fine, but like they're not going to magically fix everything. Um, Alice Goldfuss actually just spoke at DevOps Days Minneapolis and gave a really good talk um, called the Container Operators Manual. And the video is already online, so you can go watch that if you want to see more in detail about containers. Okay, I will say that for some of us, and a few in, a few in the room are as old as I am, and for some of us, uh, it, we can be kind of, you know, old school Unix, not Linux curmudgeons and say, like, come on, this container stuff isn't new. We've been doing this forever. And yes, but, and I say yes, but, because by the way, these are my actual textbooks from actual school. And these are, uh, this isn't stock photo. And uh, that is a memory board from a Convex C1 supercomputer, which is the computer I learned to play NetHack on. So I'm just saying. Um, but the, we can look at our container family album and we can say, okay, uh, she wrote itself, yeah, maybe not, but I was definitely there for zones and, you know, jails, and we've got, LXC was perfectly good, and this Docker thing is kind of newfangled, and what's going on with this? And honestly, what I would say is the genius of Docker is having made something that was pretty inapproachable for a lot of people uh, significantly more usable. And so that's kind of a, a usable, that's a takeaway for us, is like, we can build really complex systems that are really elegant, but if people aren't gonna use it, that's not super helpful. Like we're not gonna necessarily get the results we want. And so building usability into our tools, um, including our system in tools, is really important for adoption. Um, I will also say that there's, there's kind of this trope that containers are gonna definitely solve all of our problems. And I will tell you that they, they do to some extent. Um, I was working uh, in an operations role at a startup. In the reason I took that job in 2014 is because this, start, uh, this startup had started using Docker in production in October 2013, when like I think the main thing on Docker's website at that point was giant letters in blink that said, "Under no circumstances should you run this in production." And we were like, "Yolo!" And you know they they got acquired. They're part of AT&T now, so I guess sometimes uh, Warner Brothers or AT&T, Time Warner, et cetera. So I think sometimes YOLO works out, but this is not me endorsing YOLO necessarily. Um, I will say that we have to be realistic about the kind of problems that we can get into with containers. And probably the first one to realize is just because you've shipped your entire uh, image that has all your dependencies, and so that solves that problem, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of the developers on your developer team are, are your development teams are going to be comfortable constructing those. So like you have containers and that's cool, but the containers have to come from somewhere and you probably don't want to take somebody's laptop and drop that in the data center, right? Um, so that brings us to the CI CD. And I think it's really important, again, like when somebody says, I definitely want to dev some ops, where do I start? It's really important for us to talk about those repeatable processes that we create that we can use to generate those container images. Like this is a foundational layer that's really important. Um, for CI CD stuff, I mean, honestly, like there's a lot of choices out there. I like, you know, GitHub because turns out uh, I, work, I work at a little company, by the way, that some of you may have heard of, Microsoft. I think we're, I'm hoping we go places in this cloud space. It's pretty exciting. Um, but Happily, we micro GitHub soft uh, is one entity now. So I would say it's worth taking a look uh, if you haven't figured out how you want to set all your pipelines up. It's worth taking a look at the GitHub integrations that are possible. Um, and let's see. Orchestration and application definition. This is where the Kubernetes stuff sit, uh, sits. And if you're thinking, yes, I can start listening to now. She's actually talking about Kubernetes. OK, cool. There's a lot here. It's a complex space. So instead of just like, eh, you should look at CICD, I have a little bit more detail here. Mainly, 
you definitely need to orchestrate those containers because say you just have like you know your RC scripts and your your instances on your cloud provider start up and then they launch a container or containers like that's great but what happens if there's any sort of problem I will tell you that no system including systems that you don't have to go rack and stack is going to be perfect so from time to time things are going to need to be relaunched um, and you need some kind of tooling doing that. Hopefully not a series of shell scripts, though I've definitely done that. Um, all right, but let's see. I will say that if you're thinking about Kubernetes, um, how many people here have taken a look at Kubernetes so far? I would say about 80% of the room. And how many of you are running Kubernetes in production? I think about 12, maybe 14 hands. And the reason I bring that up is because just like it with Docker, there's always going to be this gulf between we've checked it out and, oh, that's actually prod. That's ready to go. And if you're thinking to yourself, but Kubernetes has been around for five years. Like, have I missed the party? Am I, am I too late? Actually not. Like, now is an excellent time to be jumping in. Like, at this point, five years in, uh, the most exciting things happening in most of the releases is like, oh, excellent. Uh, which bugs are we fixing? Oh, those really bad ones. So it's it's uh, 1.16 is on the horizon. Uh, my manager, Lockie Evenson, is actually um, the release captain for 1.16. So, uh, and this is this is another thing. Is like if you're thinking to yourself, I want to get involved with Kubernetes, but I'm not sure where. Um, the release team has uh, shadows every time, and there's a whole bunch of SIGs, the special interest groups, that all welcome people who want to check this stuff out. Uh, I will say that just because you have containers and just be because you have container orchestration does not mean that your applications are going to work well in that environment. And honestly, the problem with that is because, uh, as an old boss of mine, Tim Gross, who now works at Hashi, um, at HashiCorp, says, uh, you have conservation of complexity. So you're going to take that complexity and you're going to move it around and you're going to shove it in the container and you're going to distribute um, all your IPC into network calls and like you still have these problems like you still have to solve these problems and one of the problems with um, you know containerized applications that you're running on a cluster manager is uh, you have to care about exactly how your um, packages for your applications are being managed and so this is an open source project that I'm actually, I was in DevRel at Microsoft and I just moved to be a PM on the team that does upstream Kubernetes open source stuff, including Helm. So I'm going from here to Helm Summit in Amsterdam. So next week, so that's exciting. Um, but this is like apt or yum or whatever, but for Kubernetes. So it's, a, it's an open source project. Um, it is CNCF governed, it's a CNCF incubating project. And it's worth looking at if you're, even not for necessarily apps coming from someone else, but for apps you're packaging yourself. Um, I would say it, it, gets, it obviates that we have the wiki page that tells us how we you know, package this particular app. It's also, I think there's only one thing on this slide that is totally a lie, and it's rollback. And I don't know how many of you have been like on call for production and have that same PTSD itch in the back of your neck for the word rollback. But basically, if, you're, um, if you think you can roll back time, like I have news for you, I mean, Share can't roll back time, and neither can you. Or if you can, please talk to me, because that's an exciting startup. Um, but basically, you have to be ready to deal with state, which state is so evil and terrible, but it's also where your customers and your money live. So like, you have to care about it, but when you are deploying new versions, anything around state is going to be a little messy in terms of, I would really like to go back to before that paged me. So it's because uh, in Helm, you're, if you would like to reship version 2, because version 3 is terrible, you reship, you reship version 2, and that's the new version 4. So you're always rolling forward. Um, and oh, and of course, if you are looking for an excuse to do yet another event next week in Amsterdam, say, uh, Helm Summit up in Amsterdam should be fun. So you can take a look. Okay, um, another thing you might want to look at, if you're thinking to yourself, 
Excellent. You've been telling us about Helm, and that's great, and my applications definitely need versions and dependencies, but there's a lot more to your application than just um, the application itself, right? Because there's also that like session store, and there's your database, and there's a whole bunch of other bits of glue uh, that are more than just your application. Happily, uh, Cloud Native Application Bundles is a spec that is, you know, again, like, you know, out there, it's public. There's actually a lot of folks who are working on that particular thing. Um, the Duffel implementation is, it's a very simple CLI, just so you can try CNAB out. Um, I would say you probably would get, and again, like, I have links at the end. I haven't even been podcasting that much, but I still have links in the show notes in my head. I will tweet the deck, and there will be links at the end. But um, duffel.sh does have some information about this. I would say Porter is one, porter.sh, that you can see there's a theme here, lots of .sh. Um, Porter is one that is probably worth looking at because, again, this is, it's open source, it's early on, but it's very interesting in terms of making it much easier to ship your CNAB bundles. Um, and it packages everything up for you. So. Yeah. Uh, okay, I am not going to do this demo because I have absolutely no idea what got uh, moved over to this laptop, but probably since I exported it all as TIFF, we will have a picture of what the demo would have been. <laughs> um, but, oh wait, oh, it actually does move. Well, anyway, we're out of time, so I will post those later. But I will say the, uh, in terms of Porter, it's worth looking at just because it makes it easier to package your application with all its dependencies. Okay. Um, yeah. So let's, let's talk a little bit about this space. There is a question of perspective. And from this perspective, this does look like a pretty open, wide open space. And from this perspective, this is a very complex, busy port. And the most interesting thing about this is that that bird hasn't moved. I literally, I moved, but the bird didn't. And what the whole scene looks like is very different than what that first picture especially would imply. Uh, the reason I took these pictures, um, this was in uh, Barcelona when I was there for KubeCon EU. And the reason I took these pictures, and I was, it made me think about the fact that we bring our own perspectives of how we think this stuff actually works we bring that to the party. And we can be right and at the same time have an incomplete version, uh, you know, vision of what's out there. And so that's, you know, hashtag DevOps. That's kind of the, we want to make sure that we're taking into account all of the other things that aren't necessarily our exact purview. I mean, I just ran through a whole bunch of, you know, tech stuff, which is great, but there's, there's more to the story, basically than exactly that. Um, I will say that, this is a quote from Charity Majors, but there's really a lot of good organizations, um, including, for example, Datadog in this space, um, who can help us get the visibility into our systems that we want. Because this is the, the section on observability, and it's basically uh, trying to define what is reality, what is right. Is this working? Is this broken? I mean, these are actually really hard questions, right? And so what we need is enough uh, data from our systems being put in a way that we can get information out of it, that we can solve these problems. Um, and so I think this is one of those spaces where there isn't necessarily a right answer, but there probably is an answer that gets you, you know, say 80% of the way there. And this is not necessarily a roll your own sort of space. You're monitoring and observability tooling. Um, you're gonna want to make sure that you're not just running a bunch of checks against the thing that broke last time, because we all know how that goes. Okay, so that's, that's what I would say about the observability. For um, service discovery, and this is another pretty complex space, right? And, and the proxying and service meshes, and this, by the way, is one of those like super high trendy spaces right now. Like if somebody says, well, I mean, yes, we have Kubernetes, but we're setting up our service mesh. And you're like, excellent, Google, what is that? Um, and what that is, it can be a lot simpler 
than it was even a few, like last year. And so I will point out the SMI spec. Uh, this is another um, open project, you know, uh, I believe this one is in a different foundation, but it's another like foundation governed open source project. There's a lot of information on there about it. But this is basically trying to solve the problem of your organization decides to use Istio, but later, your organization decides that it probably wants to use Linkerd. Do you have to redo all that work? I mean, hopefully not, right? Oh, it turns out you have really good integrations with all your hashy stuff, and now you want to use Console Connect. Do you have to start over? I mean, no, because uh, all of the people who have started putting specs together have said, like, hey, this should actually be a standard. This should actually be a lot easier to use. Um, and this is... Okay, uh, and this is just a, you know, your typical logo wall slide, except instead of trying to sell you something, this is literally just organizations that are working with the service mesh interface spec, uh, like actively, and there's other organizations that are using it, obviously. But this is the sort of thing where if you're trying to figure out how to do your service mesh stuff at your organization, this is probably useful for you just to realize that there's a lot of uh, vendors and um, end user companies in this space who are creating the, uh, the spec. And the, the TLDR of like what the spec gives you is basically, you know, again, like this is a TLDR slide. So um, it's basically you want a standard spec and you want it to be flexible and you want it to be extensible. And you're like, excellent, what's the catch? Because I do not trust anyone who tells me everything is that wonderful. And it's like, yeah, of course. I mean, this is all like, a fast-moving open source space where you're going to have to try the different tools and see which ones work for you. Um, but that is fairly useful. Let's, let's see, since perhaps the demos actually work, I could try this one. Let's see. Hey, hey, look at that. Okay, um, so this is, this is a, a traffic split with Istio. And it's of interest because, and we're just going to say, all right, this blue version is where we're going to send some of the traffic, but we want to run a canary, and we want to send only some of the traffic to the canary. And if you're thinking, oh, yes, I do this, and I do it by standing up new instances, and yada, 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 and you're like, okay, cool, but if you're using something like Kubernetes, you don't necessarily want to manage that manually. So you can have some of your traffic going to the blue and some of the traffic going to the green. And routing that traffic, you know, um, again, with the weights there, you can route the traffic to um, your testing needs and then uh, cut it over completely if, you know, if the new one ends up being everything you want it to be. And so that's, it's just a very brief visual to help you realize that, and again, this is the one with Istio, but you can do SMI stuff with any of the service meshes out there. Um, and it's, it's worth looking at just because you have a lot of choices, but as long as you're using one that's SMI compliant, you're not going to have cross-compatibility issues. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, all right, so that's the service mesh space. Uh, let's take a look at the you know, networking policy, et cetera. This is one of those ones where, um, how many of you work at like larger enterprises? I'm just like, oh, there's only like a, probably maybe 15% of the room. That's interesting because sometimes you get a lot of people from large enterprises and sometimes you get a lot of people from startups who are like, Excellent, I can roll out service mesh tomorrow. And for the people at the enterprises might be thinking to themselves, all of this sounds great, but I can't have nice things because, you know, compliance or whatever. And um, I think that that's kind of an excuse because in this space, you don't have to have that kind of sadness because there's also, again, more open source projects in the space. Um, the open policy agent, and you can take a look at its website, but the nice thing about something like OPA is that it can help you uh, define your compliance needs in code. 
which is to say you want to have the definitions you know, in your pipelines, you want it to break the build if somebody's trying to push something that they shouldn't, or you want it to just not launch if somebody is trying to do something that they shouldn't. And the they shouldn't is probably defined by people who you're a little frustrated by everything that they want to define, but you have to implement it, right? And so this, in the Kubernetes space, um, it's worth looking at uh, OPA for this. Um, specifically, and I'll, I'll see if uh, running this uh, demo video works, um, Gatekeeper, it's, it's actually a really interesting example of an open source project that Microsoft was working on originally internally as a tool for Azure, and then, you know, last year, and then realized we actually should be solving this policy and compliance issue upstream. And then, sure, we can make a product that we sell as a supported uh, entity for our customers, but this should be upstream because this is not specific to our cloud. This is not specific to our use case. Um, so let's take a look at Gatekeeper. And this one, um, the, uh, the, this video actually, like the, like the first video, um, was uh, created by Lockie Evenson, my manager. Um, and this one is, it's interesting because it has a little bit of a narrative. So if you go to work, some, you know, tell me if you've had this experience. You go to work and suddenly there are new rules and it's like, sounds a little unrealistic because, hey, all of your containers that you're going to run have to come from the internal trusted registry. We don't want to let anyone launch anything, you know, from public Docker Hub or whatever. And you're like, okay, this is actually possible. Again, like in the Kubernetes space, right now we've got, uh, you know, any kind, your, your spec can match specific things, including which repos you're allowed to pull from. So again, this is your policy that if you have something like Gatekeeper, you can set these constraints. I don't know about you, but I feel like every time somebody asks for a one-off, you absolutely are going to forget exactly what happened, and then later, you're like, okay, oh, we're trying to create a resource not from there. Yeah, that's the only allowed repo. Cool. And then you can, you can picture building this into your automation, um, making it so that if somebody is not bringing an image from like an approved place, or if, for example, um, we want them to make sure it's in the approved place, and then, all right, now it'll succeed. Uh, this is the sort of thing, and this is just a trivial example, obviously, but there's an awful lot of like, you know, pad security policy and all sorts of things that you might want to apply that are much easier to do with uh, open policy agent tools. So, all right. So that was a very brief whirlwind uh, look at a whole bunch of the tools in this space that don't even get you to the entire cloud native roadmap. They get you to, you know, two thirds of it. Um, but there is more to think about, and so I want to make sure to reserve a little bit of time for this, because at the beginning, I was like, blah, blah, DevOps. Here you are at the DevOps Days conference in Cape Town, blah, blah, blah. Um, I will say that, uh, and I've shown this slide before, and I wanted to show this one again, because I feel like there's, there is uh, one really important word in this slide. Um, and I, for, for my money at least, I think it's communication, which is to say Conway's Law and if I, again, if I go back so you can read the entire thing, Conway's law is often interpreted as you're going to ship your org chart. And while that does happen, I think the most important thing is not necessarily that you have to rearrange all your teams every time you're going to do a new in initiative, but you definitely have to rearrange how the communication happens inside your org because that ends up being th how those signals are passed um, ends up being really difficult to navigate if people inside your organization are just not reasonable and don't listen to the completely reasonable service mesh thing you want to do, then your awesome initiative is not going to launch because uh, the communication inside your organization is not allowing for it. So this is, a, this is not a come on people, smile on your brother now sort of talk. This is, hey, turns out we actually are all in this together as people and Tactically speaking, if you can get the other people to feel like you understand the thing that they want and you understand their constraints and you understand their use cases and you understand their needs, it makes it so much easier to get them to see your point and to get them to see what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I will say that, and this, this is a, 
amusing to me because we have cat pictures, we have the absolutely adorable uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation um, owned uh, Fippy and Friends. Um, Karen Chu from Microsoft uh, created these and then we donated them to the CNCF, which means they have very cute stuffies at their, like little stuffed toys at their events now. Um, but I will say that, I'll say this, is that it's very easy to say this is the way things should be. And we can, I can make a slide about it. I, I gave a whole bunch of talks a couple years ago that basically asserted that computers were the easy part and that dealing with people was the hard part. And we all know this isn't really true, right? I mean, it's, it's not true. It's basically, I, I would cross that out and I would say complex systems are complex. And you're building complex systems and your organization is a complex system. And so all of the stuff that you learn here, the tactical things about how to do things with Istio matter, but getting someone at your organization to want to let you use Istio also matters. And I think this is one of the places, I saw some stuff on Twitter because uh, jet lag is, is a pernicious foe, which means I spent a bunch of time reading Twitter instead of sleeping. Terrible, I know. And what I, what I saw was some people uh, talking about the devaluing of non-technical roles. And I'm just like, uh-huh, okay, so I'm a PM right now, but that doesn't make me not technical. That makes me someone who has got enough perspective in this space that I can see some patterns across it. Uh, same with your managers. They probably understand just fine what you're trying to do, and they have a different set of constraints. So, like again, if you could define all of the constraints on your job in YAML, it would be so much easier. I mean, unless you hate YAML, <laughs> which I do feel like I, I gave, a, I think, 11 three-hour Kubernetes workshops last year, and I always felt the need to say, if YAML upsets you, I'm so sorry. Kubernetes has a lot of YAML. We can have a content warning for YAML, but you're, you're going to find that there is a lot of YAML. Um, but I will say that uh, it's not as easy, right, as taking the things that you know to be true and defining them technically, because you also have all of these people that you're interacting with. I think the, the way you can, one way that you can get all of these people to listen to you in your very reasonable assertions about the service mesh of choice you absolutely want to use because you're definitely gonna Kuber some Netties right now, is you could tell them, look, um, it's, this is not a theoretical exercise anymore. Like, I assure you, um, there is a very good chance that your bank and your government and your airline are all using Kubernetes to some degree of success. And it's a little terrifying to think about the fact that the things that feel, even just a couple years ago, felt very edgy and very new are ratcheting into the mainstream faster than we would think. Um, I would say we're definitely at a place of mainstream adoption. Uh, we have a lot of um, organizations that are jumping into this cloud and containers and Kubernetes space. And if your organization is not, you probably want to figure out why. Um, and if it's because somebody doesn't want their job to change and they're pretty sure that the stuff they like to slash know how to do is going to be obviated, and so they come up with some reason to resist change, like, just be aware, that is going to be a thing. And by the way, if you're looking at these slides and you're like, this lady does not understand hemispheres, um, I will say that, oh, I did, leave, uh, I did leave one slide out that I was going to put here, which is, yes, I'm aware that uh, it is spring that is coming here. I will say that um, in the uh, Game of Thrones-esque, you know, um, winter is coming, I, it, I feel like that's a very op sort of slogan. It's like, yes, everything is fine now, but I just know it's not going to be. And it's, I find it comforting. It's like, if you, if you always expect that things could go horribly wrong, then at least you're going to prepare yourself and hopefully protect your end users from the things going horribly wrong. Um, okay, I will say that this is a space, again, this is a space that it's very interesting to me in that we used to have um, 
I mean, by the way, I, I did take this picture um, just a, a little bit south of here, like a decade ago. There were an awful lot of penguins. They were adorable. Also, no one wanted us to pet them. I don't know. Apparently, they, they are slightly dangerous. Um, but I will say that if you're thinking to yourself, it's a little bit odd that this lady whose name I can't remember, Twitter handle, um, from Microsoft keeps talking about open source. And why is this? And is, this, is it a trap? Should I get an ax? Like, is this a trick? Um, I will say that we used to be in a very different world than we are now. And I don't know about you, but I work at an organization that is for profit. And um, you may have noticed, fun fact, money can be exchanged for goods and or services. So these are all wonderful things, but we also are in a space where there's an actual financial competitive advantage to collaborating and cooperating across the entire open source ecosystem. And so if you're saying to yourself, all of those open source tools sounded really exciting and no one's going to let me use them. Like, I think it would be worth pointing out to them that the same company that um, had the Halloween documents, and if you're not familiar with that, um, oh, yeah, welcome to the industry. Go back and read Wikipedia. Um, 20 years ago, Microsoft spent an awful lot of time being anti-open source. And uh, as of last fall, Azure was more than 50% Linux. And so I think that's an example of um, if an organization like Microsoft can have their cloud be more than 50% Linux, your organization that says we can't change things because this is the way things are, yeah, you could just point to this and be like, really? Because, I mean, organizations that have been around for a while and have a set of, you know, things that they believe that they, that they will not change, they actually do change. And you can too. Um, I will say, and this is, this is one of those things that I always try to think, do I want to bring this up? Do I want to put this in the talk? And I kind of do. And tech predictions are often wrong. And one of the reasons they're wrong is because turns out we can't read the future. But it also, I think they're wrong because we're constantly co-creating the future that we're moving towards. And this is actually where, when I said at the beginning of the talk, like, congratulations. I mean, the unfortunate news is no one is coming to help. <laughs> the good news is you are the heroes you've been waiting for. You, you have to use the fact that you have, if you're in this room, you have power. You might not think you do. You might be like, no, no, the change control review board, they have the power. <laughs> and you're like, okay, you're in this room. You can create reality with your words that you type into a computer. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure creating reality with your words is like the definition of magic. And you can do that. You can create reality with your YAML, which may not, you know, for sure be words. But like the fact that you have the power to do that means that you probably want to use that power to not create the oppressive cyberpunk dystopia that everyone seems to want to move us towards. And it's just worth thinking about. It's worth thinking about um, from a tech ethics point of view, and this is not an abstract thing. This is a, my friends, my parents, my um, you know, colleagues, my uh, children who can't figure out how to configure their systems such that they have privacy. It's not necessarily their fault, it's that we built an oppressive cyberpunk dystopia that is almost impossible to control your privacy in. And so just think about that. Like when you're making decisions about what should the defaults be in this system I'm creating? And what should the capabilities be for obfuscating or, um, you know, like making it less likely that somebody, um, especially somebody who could be vulnerable or young or not know any better, will make like a life altering mistake because of the way you set up, you know, the wide column data store. Just like think about that because we can make these choices and we probably should like make these choices to make things a tiny bit less terrifying. Um, because I will say that uh, it's very easy for someone to stand up at a conference and tell you, um, metaphorically, we're on a journey and we're going to make things better and yada, yada, yada. And you're like, I have my actual realities that I deal with. And I would say that when 
just like in like a, an agile, lean, DevOps, whatever, when someone sets a goal that feels impossibly far away, then whether it's we're going to be, I think one time I met with someone who told me, we're going to uh, implement containers by the end of Q3. And I was like, cool. Um, that, you know, it, it was summertime, and I was like, that seems like an aggressive timeline. Why? And it's like, you're not, the tech is not um, the goal, right? The tech is the tool that you're using to help your organization reach its goals. And so if the goal is iterative improvement, then just the iterative improvement of you've containerized this stuff, and now you stand up your server with a container instead of just bare metal. Well, cool, uh, or sorry, I, I misspoke because obviously virtualization is a piece in there. But say you, sta you stand up your service and it's containerized so that you can at the very least reproduce it and not have the artisanally hand whittled terrifyingness that we've all tried to troubleshoot, hopefully not at three in the morning, but you know that that's coming. Um, and so like everything that you learn from talks here, but also learn from discussions with your peers, learn in open space, figure out that you want to talk about and propose for open space, all of those things, you're not a failure if you don't go back to the office Monday morning and implement all of it like immediately. Actually, it would be a little terrifying if you did, right? Because your colleagues are not all here. Some of them are perhaps, but they're not all here. And I assure you that your colleagues who are on call are not going to love it if, you, if you're like, excellent, I learned all of the things about service mesh and we're going to yellow that out into production on Tuesday morning. Like that's not actually going to make anyone happy. So like you're going to want to improve at the rate that, hopefully a quick rate, but the rate that works for your organization so that it's sustainable, right? Because you're, I am so sorry if someone told you that an enterprise transformation of DevOps, yada, yada, is a thing. It's actually not. That is not true. Um, you do not transform, and then by the end of second quarter, you're done transforming, and now I guess you're a transformer and very powerful. I, maybe maybe there's continuous firepower. I don't know. But like that's not real. Like just like anything else. Like say um, you know my spouse Joe and I met with a personal trainer because I realized that I don't like going to the gym or exercising at all. But if I pay someone to stand there and tell me you have to exercise, like I'll at least be more likely to show up, right? But that doesn't mean that when I go to the gym, hopefully, and actually exercise and then become fit and healthy, and then I'm done, and I never have to do it again. Like, that's not true. And I think that there's a lot of, just because of the way incentives are set up in our organizations, and because of the way that you're driving the garden route and you want to imagine, that, that is, in fact, the garden route, and you're driving the garden route and, you, route and you want to imagine that you will get to the end and it will be magical, and it will be magically delicious, and what it actually will be is Port Elizabeth and somebody will try to carjack you, and it's a whole thing. Um, <laughs> This happened to me also. Um, but like, you're on this journey with your colleagues to improve everything together. It doesn't mean you're going to improve and be done. You're just on this journey. And that's actually OK, and it's kind of great. Um, I will say this is my pinned tweet. And I bring this up because, again, I think that we are in a space where we can drive a lot of change in our organizations. And we can drive that change. In, by some ways, you can say people at this other organization that are just like us, that are down the street and doing something similar to us, um, people at that organization are uh, making these changes. And there's a bit of a kind of competitive feel of, gosh, uh, if we don't let people at our organization improve any of these things, perhaps they will choose to go work at the competitor. That is true, but I also think this is a space where we all get better together. And so saying like, oh, well, you work at Microsoft, so clearly you're not going to use a Mac yet. No, I have a Mac with a Microsoft asset tag on it. Like, it's fine. Because we're in a space where everyone gets better together. And so when you're in open space, when you're discussing these things with people who you're like, well, I mean, they, they work at a competitor, I mean, you don't have to talk about your secret sauce, but a lot of these uh, issues that you run into are very translatable across orgs. So this is... 
I'm very excited to see what kind of conversations you have and what comes out of them, because this is actually awesome. Uh, I do have some links here uh, if you want to look up some more of that stuff that I showed. Um, Deuslabs.io has a lot of those open source projects. Um, there's container.training is kind of fun. Uh, this is a open source a Kubernetes training that uh, Jerome Petazzoni, formerly of Docker, he, he was actually an early employee at DocCloud, to give you an idea of how long ago that was. Um, but he was at Docker for quite a while and now runs a consultancy doing training. Um, he will come into your institution or bank and run you through days of container training and Kubernetes training if you want to have that. But the part that I think is really exciting about that is, again, this is open source training. And there's a Git repo. And you can submit pull requests to help make the training better. And like that's the kind of mentality that you want to have going forward for the rest of these couple days is, how do we get better together? Because you know, there's like perfectly good uh, things from one particular point of view that you can learn from, but you can also co-create the learning, and you are co-creating the learning here today. Um, so that's it. That's what I've got. Um, thank you so much for your attention. And remember, what you get out of DevOps days is going to be what you put into it. This is not a just watch videos at home thing. You could just go home and watch videos. This is where you're interacting. So please, my challenge to you is make sure you talk to at least one person today that you have never talked to before because you will get so much out of that. All right. Thank you.